All right, this past week I covered the Union of BC uh, Municipalities Convention. It was here in the capital in Victoria. This is the big uh, shindig every year. Uh, a lot of the mayors and councillors uh, from all over the province get together. I think the number was 1,500 of them this year. They vote on resolutions uh, that are mostly symbolic in nature, and they're usually aimed at uh, senior levels of government, usually the province, sometimes the federal government. This past week, one of the many resolutions passed by the delegates, after quite a passionate debate, I must say, was a resolution that called for the decriminalization of marijuana and for governments to look at regulating and taxing the industry. Significant development, mayors and councillors. So the third level of government and probably the one closest to home for most Canadians saying, you know what? The war on drugs, at least this particular drug, has been a failure. It is a huge industry in B.C. Let's try to get some taxation out of that. Now, uh, I have to say that the B.C. government shows no interest in this issue, nor does the federal government of Prime Minister Stephen Harper. But, as I say, still very important, I think, that we have uh, a level of government here. That, and, by the way, the vote was not even close enough that it had to go to an electronic tiebreaker. It was a show of hands, and it carried the day. Dana Larson is the director of Sensible B.C in the cannabis dispensary and he joins me now how are you dana hey i'm doing great thanks for having me i'm also joined by chuck Doucette, president of the drug prevention network of canada mr Doucette, how are you today i'm well thank you thanks uh, to both of you for coming on dana i'll start with you i, I know i spoke to you briefly outside of that uh, convention when the mayors uh, uh took that vote but uh, just for our listeners what, what's your reaction to what they did this, uh, this week well, I think it's a tremendous first step forward, and this shows that there's a growing political consensus that uh, prohibiting cannabis is the wrong way to go, and especially the enforcement against uh, just regular pot smokers, and that we want to take those people off the front lines of the war on drugs and figure out how we're going to start to regulate and tax uh, the cannabis plant in our modern society. I, I always hear, though, that cops never go after the regular, the, the you know, the small-scale pot smokers. Dana, they, they never get busted. Uh, well, actually, the rate of people being charged for possession of cannabis has doubled over the last six years in B.C. And, uh, you know, police spend a lot more time just telling people to put out their joint, taking away their marijuana, harassing people and uh, seizing their cannabis. There's almost 20,000 instances of that every single year. So it does take up a lot of time. It's true that most folks don't go to jail for lengthy sentences for cannabis uh, possession in B.C. anymore, but... Uh, they still get arrested. They still face a criminal record, which can haunt them for the rest of their lives. Uh, Chuck Doucette from the Drug Prevention Network of Canada. Uh, and again, as I said, this is kind of a symbolic vote, given that the mayors have no power on this issue. But they say it's time to decriminalize marijuana. What do you say? Well, you know, my concern is for the well-being of the children in our society. And, and I ask you this, you know, uh, both alcohol and tobacco uh, have been legal and regulated for years, yet we still have more children using them than any other illegal drugs, and they still continue to cause more deaths and costs to our society than all the illegal drugs combined. So I'm not sure how treating uh, marijuana or any other drug like we do alcohol and tobacco is the answer. So you, I can't you, see how that's you, going to lead to less problems. You oppose decriminalization. Well, I mean, the decriminalization is already there. I mean, really, nobody gets a criminal record for under 80 grams. And, you know, the Young Offenders Act, no young person gets a criminal record for anything. So it's already there. All we're talking about is an excuse for adults. <laughs> to use it. Well, uh, but we just heard from Dana Larson, and he, he, his numbers are correct. I've looked into this. In fact, possession charges are up in BC. People are still getting busted for, for having this stuff, huh, Mr. Doucette. You know, how many of them are being busted on a primary incident versus being busted for something else and also have ah. under possession? You know, did you take that into consideration when you looked at the numbers? Dana Larson, what about that? Is this a pol police charging people with, with possession because they can't charge them with other stuff? Well, charges have doubled over the last five or six years, so I don't see why they'd be doubling like that if there wasn't an increase in uh, police action against possession. We're actually launching a study to find this information out. The police aren't really uh, easy to get good statistics out of. You've got to do some effort to get those numbers. But, uh, but the numbers have doubled. Charges are going up for possession. There's no way around that. Uh, Dana Larson, do you really want governments regulating and taxing marijuana? Is that, is that where you see this country going? Uh, if done properly, yes, that's exactly what we need and where we'll be going. And that is the ultimate uh, solution to the problems caused by cannabis prohibition. Uh, you know, we need to find out what those rules are going to be. And I think people should be allowed to grow cannabis in their own home, but with limits and with rules to make sure it's safe and, and you know, with some kind of uh, controls over it. 
But absolutely, you know, we got people to stop making uh, alcohol in their own homes, which would burn down homes and stills would explode. And nobody does that now. And if they do make their own alcohol, they do it safely because we ended alcohol prohibition. Ending marijuana prohibition will get cannabis out of grow ups and out of basements and into greenhouses where it actually belongs. Uh, Dana, what about what Mr. Doucette just said? You know, yeah, okay, we've got legalized uh, uh, sales of tobacco and alcohol, and they cause a lot of problems, a lot of problems. They, they cause a lot of deaths in this country every single year. Do we, do we really need to legalize an, another intoxicant? Well, I'd wonder if Mr. Doucette advocates banning tobacco and alcohol and if he thinks things are better during alcohol prohibition because, yeah, alcohol is very inherently dangerous on its own, the way it works, but we've worked to minimize those dangers to reduce the use of that. Tobacco use has dropped drastically over the last 10 years, and we haven't had to make any laws to put anybody in jail to do that. We've used taxes. We've used public education and awareness. Those are the tools that the anti-cannabis crusaders should be using to reduce cannabis use, not prison and courts and police. That's a very inefficient way to reduce the use. Uh, any response to that, Chuck Doucette? Well, I'll remind you that alcohol and tobacco kills more people than all the illicit drugs put together. You know, it might have been reduced, but it's still huge. About 2,000 people a year die really with alcohol-related problems and about 5,000 a year tobacco-related in B.C. alone. So, again, how is treating marijuana like that going to help? And, you know, the, the, the fact that, that uh, we're going to try and tax marijuana, well, just because we make it legal or regulated, how is that going to suddenly stop all the people that are presently growing it and making money from it? Stop. Is there some kind of an agreement that Mr. Larson knows about that I don't know about where all those growers out there have agreed that they're going to go legit just because we, you know, we tax this? Who's going to pay that taxes? They're going to continue to buy it in the black market. And are we going to give it to all, everybody? No matter how old you are, or are we going to only give it to adults? Well, I, I would assume if if we ever got to the the, the point of decriminalization, and and uh, I don't think we're, we're 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 there yet. I would assume that there would be strict controls, Chuck just said, on you know ages and 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 that kind of thing, and and points of sale, much like we have with alcohol and tobacco. And nobody's going to break those laws, right? Everybody's going to all of a sudden abide by those new laws, just like they do the ones now. What's going to change? Dane Larson. Oh, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, to claim that there's going to be no changes at all. How many folks do you know who make alcohol in their own homes with a still? In fact, if you watch TV, you see commercials for Seagram's where they talk about their prohibitionist past and how they used to be a company that was devoted to smuggling alcohol into the U.S. So now they're legitimate, they're mainstream, they pay taxes. A lot of the current alcohol companies and brewers were originally people who functioned under alcohol prohibition and smuggled Canadian alcohol into the U.S. No one's saying that legalizing cannabis is going to make everything perfect and reduce and stop every single problem associated with it, but it'll solve a lot of the problems. We've got to move towards a regulated and taxed market. The idea that everything is going to be exactly the same if we legalize is uh, just nonsense. I don't really understand where he's coming from on that. Gentlemen, stand by. I'll take a break. My guests are Chuck Doucette from the Drug Prevention Network of Canada, Dana Larson, Director of Sensible BC. I do welcome your calls, comments, questions on this issue. Do you agree with the mayors and councillors, not all of them, I'm not trying to say that, but a majority who voted it's time to decriminalize, or do you agree with Mr. Doucette and, and a lot of those people at the convention who said, no, uh, this is not the way to go. 604-280-9898, star 9898 on your cell phone, and long distance toll free, 1-877-399-9898. You're listening to CKNW News Talk 980. All right, we're talking pot uh, decriminalization as called for by BC's mayors and councillors in a majority vote uh, this past week. Dana Larson, my guest from the uh, Sensible BC group, and Chuck Doucette, president of the Drug Prevention Network of Canada. I do welcome your calls on the open lines at 280-9898. Let's go to Mike in Vancouver. Hi, Mike. Hi, uh, Mr. Doucette. I'd like to associate myself uh, with your comments. So well argued, sir. Uh, the, the idea is this. If alcohol is a broken arm to society, you don't need to break the leg, too, by uh, bringing in drugs, which are much more uh, addictive than even alcohol. Um, but but uh, my question is this. Uh, does the supporter of a legalization, um, if Seagram's makes uh, alcohol and Molson makes uh, uh, alcohol, does he see perhaps the cigarette companies uh, taking over uh, the making of marijuana cigarettes, and would he support that? 
Interesting question. Dana Larson, how would you practically see that rolling out? Is, is Rothman's going to start uh, making uh, doobies for sale or what? Well, I'd rather see like a, mine, a wine-based model where you have producers who are regulated and licensed by the government but still independent, and they sell their product to the government, which then resells it through license uh, distribution branches in a similar way to wine. Uh, that way you get the best of a regulatory model. Uh, and you get some control over it, but you don't have the government actually growing marijuana, which I don't think they would do a very good job at. But, you know, there's lots of different ways we could regulate and control it. That's simply one model that we could use. Uh, any comment uh, on your part, Chuck, to set? Uh, well, interesting. Yeah, uh, I wonder why he doesn't want the government growing it. Probably because they wouldn't grow a high enough THC level for the people that are used to smoking it. And, and therefore, if the stuff that's sold at these so-called uh, government-controlled stores isn't a high enough THC, where are people going to buy the stuff they're used to smoking with the higher THC? They're going to continue buying it from the guy down the street where they've always bought it from. Why would that guy continue selling it? He's making money off it now. He's going to make money off it then. It's not going to change. You know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, how, why is it more alcohol and tobacco used more by young people than illegal drugs? Because it's more available. It's easier for kids to obtain. As soon as you make pot, more available if if it becomes legal for adults to use and it's sitting around the house more more kids are going to use it the is, more is availability not, the more use the more use the more problem is there not something to that dana larson that you know you do take away that stricture even if it's loosely enforced as it is right now that that it you do get more pot in the hands of kids no it's not spelled all backwards in fact youth have it easy find it easier to get marijuana than they do alcohol because People who sell cannabis don't always ask for age ID, but certainly a liquor store does. And also the use of tobacco now is actually lower than the use of cannabis among youth, which shows that prohibition is not the right way to deal with this. The thing that's illegal is getting more popular. The one that's legal is getting less popular because they're using the right means to control it. They're using regulation. They're using advertising and information. That's how you reduce the use of something. But this idea that that uh, legalization of cannabis or regulation will make it more easier for youth. It's the opposite. It makes it less easier for youth. Mm. You've know, you got to read the studies carefully because that study that said that, that marijuana is easier to uh, get for kids was to buy. The question was, what's it easier to buy, to purchase? There's another study that just came out in the United States last week that made the, the question a little more clear, and it said to obtain, and it was very clear that the kids said it's easier to obtain alcohol and tobacco. Why? Because it's already in their homes. You know, it's common sense. Come on. You know, where did you get your first taste of alcohol or tobacco from? I know. I got it from my parents' cabinet. You know, because it was there. It is there. Uh, gentlemen, let's take another call here on the open lines at 604-280-9898. Greg has been waiting. Hi, Greg. Go ahead, sir. Okay, um, for this is for the, uh, the drug prevention guy. Mr. Doucette, uh, this, okay. This is a straight yes or no question. I don't want any political jargon with it. How many people and has anybody ever overdosed from marijuana? Yeah. How many people have died under the influence of marijuana because they were driving while they were impaired or operating heavy duty equipment because they were impaired? Same difference. But but Greg's point is that, I mean, because you've talked about the harms of alcohol and tobacco, uh, uh, Chuck said, and I, I completely agree with you uh, that those are much more harmful than, than uh, uh, these other drugs we're talking about here. Marijuana is not as harmful as, as alcohol or tobacco, is it? Well, it depends which way you look at it. It impairs you, and so the accidents that are caused by impairment are a very significant factor. And again, I'm going back to the children. I'm talking about, is this going to make... It easier or uh, the you know the life for a child safer, or is it going to possibly have the risks increase by having this stuff more available and easier to obtain? I can't see how changing the laws to regulate it are going to help anything, you know, other than those adults who want to smoke it. Uh, Dana Larson, uh, to that point, uh, would we not see more stone drivers on the road? I, I, you know, Chuck said I think he's got a point there that, uh, uh, okay, maybe marijuana doesn't directly kill people, but you know, you get a little wasted, you get behind the wheel. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to be the guy walking down the side of the road when a stoner drives by like that. If we want to work to keep impaired drivers off the road, then we should redirect police resources in that direction. Busting people who are using cannabis in a peaceful way, who aren't bothering anybody else and who aren't driving, is not the way to keep cannabis out of the hands of youth. It's not the way to stop people from using cannabis and driving. We didn't ban alcohol 
in order to stop drinking and driving. We use public education campaigns. We use enforcement against that particular thing. That's how we deal with that. And those are the ways we should be dealing with cannabis. All these other things are red herrings around the idea that adults should be able to use cannabis if they choose. They should be able to buy it and access it or grow it themselves in a safe manner. And those are the people that are being punished. And it's really a make-work program ultimately for the RCMP is what the whole war on cannabis ultimately has become. Dana Larson, Chuck Doucette, the debate will continue. Really appreciate your guys joining me today. Thanks a lot, guys. Hey, thank you.